This could be a controversial question. Unfortunately, there are more things than pure research that drives our decision making. It's sometimes a sensitive subject. And I do not want to offend anyone. I'm just curious and seek the truth. Hello, welcome back to Myelopathy Matters, the official podcast of the charity myelopathy.org. Where we talk all things degenerative cervical myelopathy from the perspective of the professionals, the researchers and the people living with myelopathy. I'm Ben Davies, neurosurgeon scientist and the founder of myelopathy.org. And I'm Ewan Sadler, a person with DCM and also a founder of myelopathy.org. This is Myelopathy Matters by myelopathy.org. Welcome back to the podcast and today it's a big and contentious topic. Is the introduction of metal rods required after myelopathy surgery from the back of the neck? Amongst surgeons this has been an intense and popular focus of debate and it's raging on. You can see this by looking at country by country variation. For example, if you live in the United States, you have a 97% chance of being offered this, whereas in the UK it's around 40%. But what about the community living with DCM? Is this a question that resonates with them, Ewan? Yes, definitely. Nine times out of ten, when someone shares a post-op x-ray or an MRI within our Facebook support group and it's got metal rods and performed on the back of the neck, you can probably guarantee they haven't had surgery in the UK. Um, For myself, I've I've had a multi-level anterior fusion from the front of the neck from C4 to C7 and I've seen people share similar pre-op MRIs to mine and then after surgery, They share the post-op x-ray and they've had an entirely different procedure with some extra bits of metal work here and there. And it makes you think, is my surgery not correct? Have I been sort of shortchanged or have they had the wrong procedure? I think deciding to have surgery is a big decision in itself. But then seeing all the different types of surgery just makes the whole process even more difficult for the person having surgery. And I think that's exactly why it emerged as one of the top 10 research priorities, you know, how we better understand the type of surgery we should be offering to those individuals. And I think wherever there is medical uncertainty, it generally means there's a lack of good quality evidence. And this question is a prime example of that. Plenty of theories and debate, but no high quality studies comparing one treatment to the other. And this is something that both we here in the UK and coincidentally, a team from Sweden decided to try and resolve by launching randomized controlled trials. And so today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Anna McDowell, spine surgeon from the University Hospital of Uppsala, as we explore her trial, MyRAN-C, and also our trial, Polyfix DCM. So I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Anna McDowell, spine surgeon from the University Hospital of Uppsala, Sweden, and also the chief investigator of MyRAN-C. Welcome, Anna. Thank you for having me here as your guest. Absolute pleasure. So we're talking about your your trial. Perhaps we could start by, you know, how did you come up with this? It was two things mostly. Um, First, my colleague in Uppsala, Peter Först, he published his results in the New England Journal of Medicine 2016 about standalone laminectomy versus laminectomy plus fusion for spinal stenosis in the lumbar spine. And his report um, resulted in a paradigm shift in Sweden with much less fusion surgeries. And secondly, I have seen for several years in CSRS meetings that colleagues in Europe and in the US tend to add long posterior fusions or do 360 fusions in patients with DCM. And then I looked within the Swedish borders and I discovered that 50% of Swedish uh, spine surgeons add a fusion to their laminectomy and 50% do not. In my experience, these patients are old and frail. The mean age is 68, most of them are retired and they have comorbidities. 16% are dead within five years of the surgery, which is more than an age-matched general population. It's not fair for the patients that the treatment differs between different surgeons. We should know for sure what is the best treatment and then we should all offer it to the patients regardless of where we live. 
And what's been your experience of discussing this this problem with your colleagues? You know, what do you think the the, the strong rationale is for instrumentation or, or against it? It depends. Uh, some uh, clinics do anterior only in most cases, and some do posterior only, and some do. 360. Some people fuse every patient and others almost never fuse. Everyone have different opinions and sometimes it stirs up feelings as well. A lot of people seem to be very passionate about this issue. Often people tend to think that the way they do it is the right way and there are no options and everyone else is wrong and do not understand a thing. What do you think drives the current variation in practice? This could be a controversial question. Unfortunately, there are more things than pure research that drives our decision making. One thing is money. Ronald Bartels has published uh, several articles about that. And of course, John uh, Ioannidis. We do not talk so much about it because we do not want to offend anyone. But everyone knows it, that money affects us and makes us biased. So if we do not have real evidence and the literature offers a smorgasbord of different reports with opposing results, then we can choose to believe what suits us in the situation that we are in at the moment. Like, for instance, if we get more paid when we add fusion to our laminectomy, then we tend to put on that certain type of glasses when we read articles to defend that type of treatment. And also, if you have treated patients in a certain way for 10 or 20 years, you want to believe that you have done well. And then, of course, you will defend yourself and the way you have done things. Because if you are wrong and have performed an inferior method or technique, that would be a disaster, right, for the patients as well as for your own self-esteem. And we are only humans. So... It's sometimes a sensitive subject, and I do not want to offend anyone. I'm just curious and seek the truth. As you may know, we've recently completed a global consultation called AO Spine Recode DCM, which has really reshaped how and where we should be conducting our research. And my impression was this occurred really because we managed to capture a very different and diverse perspective. But of course, DCM research to date has been driven largely by spine surgeons, probably 80% by spine surgeons, and strikingly 97% of whom are probably male. I just wondered, Anna, what your perspectives were as a, as a female spine surgeon, or whether you think there is a diversity issue in our specialty. Diversity is a big and important question. Speaking as a woman... I have noted when I go to meetings that I can often count the attending women on one hand. That makes me feel a little bit lonely sometimes, but then of course I always have the ladies room for myself, no cues there. I think different people have different ways in expressing themselves. They have different vocabulary, express feelings differently, and the luggage that each and everyone carries is different. I believe it is easier to empathize with different people if you have more diversity among your colleagues. The risk of a one-side conversation is never good in research and losing a perspective is a missed opportunity. So yes, it's important. And do you think that your male colleagues are aware that this is an issue? Do they buy into the fact that diversity is a problem and, and something that should be addressed? All my male colleagues, they are also individuals and some of them are more enlightened than others. I mean, my perspective is it's it's a difficult concept to communicate and particularly when our field is very one-sided already, it's, um, I think it's a big challenge to change, but I certainly subscribe to very much so from my experiences so far, that's something that we need to, we need to address. So we're talking about your, your trial. You've had some efforts to make some some advances here because you recently published a very large analysis from your Swedish spine registry. Perhaps you could take us through the the study and, and its findings. So we retrieved data on all registered patients with DCM in Swiss spine. Half of them was treated with an anterior approach, so we removed those patients. Uh, The rest had a posterior approach. Half of the patients treated with a posterior approach had standalone laminectomy and the other half had laminectomy plus fusion. 
So we compared the groups with propensity score matching and the outcome was pretty much the same in both groups. Fusion was more expensive though due to implant costs. And one of the things that I thought was quite powerful about this method and for people who aren't familiar, this is not sort of a randomized controlled trial in the sense that people have been allocated to to two different arms of a trial and followed up by a computer, but you've you've taken statistical approaches to try your best to even out the factors that may or may not influence the decision making to really try and match those groups to see if there is a difference. One thing is, uh, of course, the um, uh, alignment and instability that might have affected the surgeon's choice of treatment method. Um, and that was a, a thing, of course, that we have to think about. So we retrieved all the preoperative MRI and radiographs to perform our measurements. And I actually, I got inspired by the work uh, f- uh, of uh, Michael Feeling's group with their propensity score matching using MRI measurements like the modified K-line interval and the spondylolisthesis slip in millimeters. But of course, you still feel there is a need to have that that full-blown randomized controlled trial? Yes, it's quite um, a controversial uh, question. So perhaps we can turn our attention to the trial itself. What does the name stand for? It's myelopathy randomized controlled trial. So simple. (laughs) But one of the points of difference, because I know, uh, as you'll be familiar, we're, we're doing something similar in the UK, slightly different, and we'll touch on that in this podcast episode slightly elsewhere. But one of the points of difference in your trial is that your technique for those who don't receive instrumentation is quite specific. Uh, what is that and, and why do you think that is important? Yes, that would be the muscle preserving technique uh, described by Professor Shiraishi. The spinous process is split using a high speed uh, drill and without uh, disturbing the bilateral deep extensor muscles, the spinous process is divided at its base. And the laminectomy is performed uh, with a width uh, not extending more than two millimeters outside the dural borders, and the facet joints are not exposed. And then finally, the split fragments of the spinous process are sutured uh, together so that the muscles are restored in their original place. When muscle preservation is performed, the sagittal balance has been observed to be maintained after surgery without progression of kyphosis. Um, To clear things, I am an orthopedic surgeon, so I have my basic education on the bone and joints, and I like muscles. We wouldn't dream about destroying the muscles surrounding the knee or shoulder or elbow. Why do we then destroy the muscles of the neck? It's a mystery to me. So how are you going to decide whether this is beneficial or not? That was a hard uh, thing to decide, the primary endpoint. First, we had the patient MJOA score. I started with translating the patient MJOA to Swedish together with a colleague, and we uh, changed the Swedish spine register so that the patients would have that uh, patient reported outcome measure sent to them at the follow-ups instead of the European myelopathy score that we used to have as the myelopathy prom. Then we discussed again in our RCT group that what we were interested in primarily was the different rate of reoperations between post-laminectomy kyphosis and distal junction kyphosis. I mean, One reason for doing a fusion is because you fear the post-laminectomy kyphosis that has been reported to be between 7 to 34% in different reports. But when you do fusion surgery, there is a risk of distal junction kyphosis, or 24%. So you end up with a kyphosis either way, if you are fused or not. The focus on spine meetings is whether to end your fusion on C7, T1 or T2 instead of questioning the fusion itself. So we changed our primary outcome one year ago to reoperations. And yes, uh, of course, there is a huge uh, potential of bias when you use reoperations as outcome. I am very well aware of that. Uh, It's easy to criticize and um, we will have a hard time defending this choice. But it is evident, like I said before, in in, um, 
the Swedish spine register that 50% of Swedish spine surgeons prefer fusion and 50% prefer no fusion. So I count on that the bias will be balanced between the four research centers. That could also make room for a subgroup analysis where the different centers can be compared according to the reoperations they performed. And we have also defined the reasons for reoperations in detail, and we will monitor to see that the protocol is followed. We also, we also have very strong power for the patient MGO analysis as well, which is good. Um, but I just want to add that there are major problems with the MGO as well. For instance, it is very common with osteoarthritis in the hip and knee in the elderly. So when the patients answer questions about walking and climbing stairs and using a walking stick and so on, you don't know if it's due to the myelopathy or to osteoarthritis in their hip or knee. So, yeah, it's problematic. It's, it's a really difficult area, isn't it? Absolutely. And something that we've covered a lot through the initiatives that, that this organization has been running in terms of it, trying to improve the, the measurement tools that we have. One of the questions I had specifically, you, you linked there to the idea that, you know, amongst surgeons from the conference perspective, that reoperation rate is certainly meaningful. Do you think that's something that the, the patients themselves are also interested in? Is that something that, that they would consider a, a meaningful change? Yes, because if... Um... Both groups answer equally on uh, the patient MJOA. Then, of course, reoperation, it's a huge thing. I mean, you want to have one operation to solve your problems, not two or three or several. So, one of the challenges, of course, with I think randomized trials in particular for surgical trials is you're asking the surgeon to step back from making a decision about the operation and leave it to to a computer, which uh, I have experience in trying to persuade others in the UK to do. People get very, very um, sensitive that that decision is out of their hands. Do you think there's going to be a challenge to your colleagues agreeing to put any patient eligible into you know, either arms? We're not going to see a selection bias, for example, in the types of patients being being randomised here. Yes, of course. It's, it's hard. It's hard for me as well. But if you have decided to do a trial, then you have to follow the protocol. One of the other things I think that would be topical in this space is that people will be familiar with the concept of laminoplasty, which is, I guess, a sort of halfway house between a fusion and, uh, and, a, and a laminectomy. What, what's your experience of laminoplasty in Sweden? I, I ask that question also specifically because we recently interviewed Zoha Gogoswala after the CSMS trial, which had that randomized comparison of anterior versus posterior. And one of the subgroups that did performed particularly well in that study, although not uh, part of the randomization process, was the laminoplasty arm versus the instrumented fusion. What, what were your thoughts on, on that result and, 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 and how would that fit in, do you think, to the context of the evidence base here for surgery uh, from posterior decompression? It's not a big thing in Sweden. It's not popular. I think the laminoplasty is the foundation from where the muscle preserving technique has evolved. So I think laminoplasty and uh, muscle preserving uh, laminectomy is it's not so different. I'm not so surprised that uh, the results were like that in his study. So where are you up to now with the trial? It has uh, started and the challenge uh, right now is to find participants to enroll. Suddenly, when you sit there with patients, they always have something that excludes them from being eligible, like tandem stenosis or not being able to speak or understand the Swedish language or something else. And also, we have not enough personnel in the wards in Sweden. So the cues for getting the surgical intervention is a disaster right now. What has been the experience of, of of the patients themselves, you know, but they've been happy to have this decision made by the computer, that randomization to fusion or, or no fusion. It has been okay. Uh, I had one uh, patient that didn't want to be fused. He said no to it, but the other patients, I've had a few patients um, that are already randomized and yes, they, they have listened and yeah, I think it's okay. It's certainly our perspective here that the, the people with myelopathy are very willing to consider research. They really want to help and give back. So I guess that would that would resonate with that. And how long have you given yourself to get these trials done? I think at least three years. 
perhaps more. And and the, your primary endpoint is a five year follow up. Is that right? So it's going to be five years on top of that. Yes. So yeah. I'm going to know what to do for a long time. Well, all good things have to take time, unfortunately. But I think it is a landmark piece of, of research and uh, it really does move, as you alluded to, you know, once you made that decision to operate, once you made the decision, whether it's the front or the back, that next and final question is whether or not to, to fuse and to stabilize. And I think that is a critical knowledge gap, which, which we very much look forward to, to being answered. From a UK perspective, there's certainly a perception that, that it's not that routine stabilization required, but specifically certain scenarios require instrumentation, although there isn't really any consensus on what that is. If your trial indicates there is no routine value, how will you be able to consider the possibility that instrumentation is required just for a subgroup? Yeah, I agree. That is a problem. Like instability, for instance, the question is, what is instability in the generated cervical spine? And when do we need to fuse DSM patients due to concurrent instability? Instability is defined in the fractured spine and the rheumatic spine, but not in the generated spine. And there are no cutoff values to rely on when measuring flexion extension radiographs. So I, I hope that some subgroup analysis or some receiver operating curve regarding the alignment parameters will give some cutoff values. And that is why research and constant re-evaluation is so important. So Ewan, perhaps quite a technical conversation there, but as someone with myelopathy, what were your take-home messages? I found the whole discussion very interesting with the help of the medical jargon section of the website and, of course, being part of the Facebook support group. It gave me a good insight into why there are so many varied surgeries. And I agree with Dr. Alan McDowell that the cost and profitability of a certain procedure shouldn't be the key factor in deciding surgery. And I think when it comes to diagnosis and overall treatment, all health professionals from the doctor to the surgeon should be on the same page. And with the help of important research like this, that can be achieved sooner than later. So Ben, how does this overlap with the Polyfix DCM trial you and Mark establishing here in the UK? Well, there is a lot of overlap and offline, we're certainly exploring some opportunities to work together with Anna, um, but there are also some important differences. So firstly, our trial in the UK uses a measure of disability to define success rather than reoperation rates, for example. And we do so at two years and not five years. Secondly, we are only looking at multi-level posterior surgery. So that's operations performed at two or more levels of the spine. And thirdly, we've been more open about the type of surgery that can be performed. So I think overall, these trials are slightly different and I anticipate they should work together to inform clinical practice. They're both set up to answer the question of is routine stabilization required? We will principally determine if this is required to support early recovery within two years, whereas Myran see longer term results. And then if the trials do not find in favor of routine stabilization, Myran C will indicate if you instead need a specialist technique, whereas our trial, if any technique can be used. My hunch, however, which you can generally see when there is such variation in any form of clinical care, is that subgroups will be important, i.e. there are certain types of spinal change which benefit from a specific surgical technique. Unpicking this is much more difficult. In general, trials are designed only to answer their principal question and any other interpretation is more exploratory. But I suspect with such a large collective pot of high quality data between ourselves in the UK and Anna in Sweden, we should be able to unpick those subgroups in due course. So when can we expect the results? Well, sadly, this is going to take some time and we're probably looking at five to eight years, I suspect, and that's if all goes to plan. But don't worry, Ewan. I'm sure you'll continue to defy aging. All the Instagram filters will continue to improve. So what's up next month? Well, we're talking to Dr. Carl Zipser, a neurologist from Switzerland, and Professor Konstantinos Margetis, a spine surgeon from New York, who, on behalf of the team from the RICO DCM Diagnostic Incubator Program, are going to update us on their progress to develop the first set of diagnostic criteria for DCM. Thanks very much to Anna McDowell for joining us. This was Myelopathy Matters from myelopathy.org. The podcast was produced by Carl Homer from Cambridge TV. To keep up to date with the latest in the field of degenerative cervical myelopathy, why not subscribe on your favourite podcast app, where you'll also find all of our previous episodes. 
There's lots more information to be found at myelopathy.org, but if you've got a question about myelopathy or an experience to share, we'd love to hear it. Please do get in touch at ben at myelopathy.org. But until next time, goodbye.